Case Western Reserve University's Institute for the Science of Origins proudly presents the Origins Science Scholars Program. The Institute advances the scientific understanding and application of origins and evolution of human and natural systems. The Origins Science Scholars Lectures are presented with the assistance of Case Western Reserve University's Siegel Lifelong Learning Program, College of Arts and Sciences, and Media Vision. Tonight, it's my pleasure to introduce Laura Bernstein Curtis, a PhD candidate in biology at Case Western Reserve University and a graduate research associate at Cleveland Metro Park Zoo. Her research focuses on understanding how animals in human care interact with their environment and in finding new ways to measure animal welfare in the zoo setting. Please join me in welcoming Laura Bernstein Curtis. I'm excited to be here tonight and to get to talk to you about something I think about a lot, which is how animals think. So I'm going to start by giving sort of a broad overview of animal cognition, and then talking a little bit about the bear species. Um, then we're gonna talk about bear cognition specifically. I'm gonna go deep into three um, zoo-based zoo uh, experiments. And then we're going to talk about cognition and bear cognition as a way to measure and study animal welfare. So we'll start with just animal cognition. When you hear the words animal cognition, a number of things probably come to mind. Um, you may think of lab rats running in a maze, learning how to find their reward. You may think of mirror tests, where scientists put a mirror in front of animals and put a mark on their face somewhere and try to see if the animal can recognize that that's their face in the mirror. You may think of this study. I actually polled some of my friends to see what they thought animal cognition meant, and a bunch of people suggested this one. This was a study a few years ago with capuchin monkeys, and it was a test of inequity. So two capuchin monkeys were working on a task, and they both received a cucumber as a reward. A cucumber's pretty good, and that was fine. And then they both received a grape as a reward. And a grape is good, and they both got the grape, and that was fine. And then one capuchin was given a grape, and the other was given a cucumber. And if you've seen the video, and if you haven't, you should watch it, you've seen the, the capuchin given the cucumber gets really frustrated, starts beating his hand on the table, and he finally throws the cucumber back in the researcher's face. That's what that image is of there. Um, or you may think of tool use in animals. This is just a picture of a crow doing a tool use task. Um, tool use is something that a variety of species do and definitely comes to mind when we think of cognition. But what is cognition? What does cognition mean overall? It really includes almost everything, right? So cognition is often broken into two general sort of worlds, the physical world and the social world. So in this image, there's a coyote in a field, and there's some antelope back there. And you know that coyote knows, or deer back there, you know that coyote knows those deer are back there, and those deer know that coyote is there. And everyone's sort of aware of what's happening. And that coyote knows how to find food, where to go, what to do. And that's a really important piece of cognition, right? Finding food. And then there's the knowledge of the social world, understanding what to do with other members of your social group, who it is you want to huddle with in your meerkat pile, or who it is you're going to dig in the dirt with if you're those other meerkats. Understanding how to find social partners, how to interact with them, who to fight with, who not to fight with, who you want to be around, who you don't, that's also a part of cognition. The two may or may not be as separate as people sometimes think. One theory is called the social intelligence theory, and it's that cognition in primates evolved because primates needed to navigate complicated social relationships. So this picture is a group of vervet monkeys, and something's happening in the middle there, some kind of altercation. All the other monkeys are around, and you know they're all aware of who's fighting and why, and they're worried about what's going to happen next. And that's complicated. Knowing who your friends are, who your friends aren't, understanding dominance hierarchies within your group, that's not easy to do. And so the theory posits that that's why primates evolved these big brains and this complicated cognition, was to be able to do this. But I'm not talking about primates tonight. 
I'm talking about bears. And bears don't have quite the same sort of social grouping that primates do. They tend to be in groups like these two here, a mother cub, that last for a couple of years and then they split apart again. Except that bears absolutely have social interactions with other bears, or you wouldn't end up with cubs. <laughs> but they need to know who to interact with. Each interaction is a lot more important because it really matters if it goes right or not. If you're a male bear and you just stumble into another male bear, that could be a deadly interaction. So you have to know who's around. You have to know how to navigate that. If it's mating season, you've got to know how to find mates. So it, it may be that bears and other carnivores actually have a more complicated social world than we tend to think. I think as primates ourselves, we look at big groups of primates and we think, yeah, I get that. That makes sense. I understand what's happening there. It kind of looks familiar. But just because the social world of bears doesn't look the same doesn't mean it doesn't take some amount of complicated understanding. It's also true that bears have complicated ecological problems to solve. This picture is actually of a sloth bear uh, mother in India. She's carrying her two uh, infants on her back. Sloth bears actually carry their babies in their back till they're almost nine months old, which they're getting pretty big by that point. But they don't do it you know, just because the babies are too lazy to walk. They do it to protect them from predators. And they do it to help teach them how to forage in their environment. Bears live in a complicated changing environment and have complicated ecological problems to solve themselves. And it may be that complex cognition in bears arose to solve those problems. And it wasn't just for complicated social animals like primates. OK, so I want to talk a little bit about each of the bear species. Um, so there are eight species of bears. I don't know if that's more or fewer than you would have guessed. Um, and I'm going to mention each of them briefly, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about each one. But first, I'm just going to list them for you. So polar bears, brown bears, which covers a range of subspecies, black bears, Andean bears, also known as spectacled bears, Asiatic black bears, also sometimes called moon bears, giant pandas, and sun bears. Now, just out of curiosity, how many of you found there were bears on that list you hadn't heard of before? A few people, oh, a bunch of hands. OK, was it the Andean bears? A couple of nods. Black bear, Asiatic black bears, the moon bears, some nods for that. Yeah, sloth bears. Yeah, I think that's one, too. OK, what else, sun bears? A couple of nods. OK, well, then I'm really glad we're talking about them all. OK, I'm going to start with polar bears, which I imagine everyone in this room has heard of before. And for each of these species, I'm going to tell you where they live, what they eat. I'm going to tell you whether or not they hibernate, because if you can believe it, that's the question I get asked most about any bear species, if they hibernate or not. And I'm also going to mention their IUCN red list status. So that's the international group that assesses whether or not animals are endangered, if they're threatened, that makes those distinctions. So polar bears, as you know, live in the Arctic. They're obligate carnivores. That means they have to eat meat. Polar bears have to hunt. They wouldn't be able to survive on plants alone. Uh, polar bears do hibernate. It's very cold in the Arctic. And even with hunting, there's not a lot to eat for a few months in winter. And their status is vulnerable, which means while they are in trouble, there is still time. All right, brown bears live in North America, Northern Europe. And while that's sort of the umbrella term, there are multiple subspecies of brown bears. Grizzly bears, Kodiak bears, Hungarian bears. There's quite a few subspecies of brown bears. Brown bears are omnivores. They will basically eat anything. <laughs> and they have to, because where they live, when they wake up from hibernation in the spring, there isn't much to eat except for some roots and maybe some tubers they find underground. And then as the season changes and different fruits ripen, they're able to follow those. Uh, if they live in Alaska and they're able to eat salmon, they eat salmon when the salmon are around. Um, and they absolutely hibernate as well. And they are considered, their status is least concern. That doesn't mean there's no concern. And it doesn't mean that there aren't some subspecies and populations of brown bears uh, who are in trouble. And in fact, there's some subspecies have gone extinct, and brown bears definitely don't have the same range that they used to. American black bears, um, they're really North American black bears. They live in Canada and in the United States. 
And while they do overlap some with brown bears, they venture far further south into the US than brown bears do. They're also omnivores. They'll also eat just about anything. Um, you may hear stories in the news about uh, black bears in particular wandering into kids' parties, falling through roofs, and eating all the cupcakes. <laughs> Um, black bears are actually also the only species of bear whose number is currently increasing. So black bears are slowly starting to come back. Doesn't mean they don't have problems either, but they are at least their status is of least concern. Okay, next up is Andean bears. If you haven't heard of them, it's because we don't have them here in the U.S. In fact, they are the only South American bear, and they live, as you can tell from their name, in the Andes. They actually live in about five countries of South America, and they're herbivores. So we have these bears that are carnivores, and we have some that can eat anything, and then we have Andean bears who really are herbivorous. They'll eat meat, they'll eat small rodents, they'll eat things they come across, but they mostly eat bromeliads, a kind of plant that grows in South America. And they're very arboreal, so they climb trees a lot to eat. Um, they do sometimes attack cattle, which is a problem for farmers in South America. And this happens when farming land starts to encroach on the bear's habitat. So it's something that is slowly increasing. They don't hibernate. They don't need to. It's warm enough where they live that they're able to find food all times of year. And their status is vulnerable. And that's partly because we only now have research telling us how many bears they are. They're hard to study. They're very cryptic. They hide. They're hard to find. And we now have a, a general count, I think, I can't tell you what it is, but a count of how many bears there are. So 10 years from now, this may change once we know if they are decreasing in the wild. OK, sloth bears. Sloth bears are not sloths. They're not related to sloths. I think people called them that because they have big claws that sort of look like sloth claws. Uh, they live in India, Pakistan, Sri Lanka, and Nepal. And they are insectivores. So they have adaptations to actually eat insects the way aardvarks or anteaters do. They'll tear open termite mounds and suck the termites out of it. Um, they'll eat fruit too. Again, they're bears. They're, they're able to eat more than just one thing. And during fruiting season, they'll eat quite a bit of fruit. But they are really known for being insectivorous. They don't hibernate. It's warm enough where they live that they don't need to. And their status is also vulnerable. All right, another lesser known species here, I think, are Asiatic black bears. So these live in the north in Asia, Japan, China, even into eastern Russia, and a little farther into South Asia sometimes. They're also omnivores. They're actually fairly closely related to American black bears. And some hibernate and some don't. The ones up in the north where it's very cold and there's not food all year will hibernate, and the ones further south who don't need to, don't. They too are vulnerable. Giant pandas, I think most people probably have heard of. Pandas are kind of a big favorite. They live in China, and they are not only herbivores, they are specialists. They only eat bamboo. This doesn't work out great for them because they have a carnivore's digestive system, which is not well adapted to eating uh, plant matter, which means they have to eat bamboo almost constantly because they're not able to get all the nutrients out of it that another herbivore might be able to. Uh, giant pandas don't hibernate either. They move further south, and they don't live in the very cold, farther northern parts of China, but they'll move south and then move north again. And they are also vulnerable. And finally, my last species of bear are the sun bears. The sun bears live in Southeast Asia. They are the smallest bear species. They range up to maybe 100, 150 pounds. We actually have one at Cleveland Metro Park Zoo who's very old. She's about 75 pounds. I mean, she's a small bear. If you come and see her, you'll know who it is. They're omnivorous, too. And because they're fairly small, they can eat insects, rodents, plant matter. They can eat a fair amount of things like that. They don't need to hunt down large animals. They don't hibernate. It's nice and warm where they live in Southeast Asia, Indonesia, Malaysia, places like that. And their status is also vulnerable. And again, this may change as we learn more about them. I was wondering about the black, the bears that have black coats but live in southern climates, uh, especially with climate change, things getting warmer. Are they suffering because they have that black fur? That's a good question. I think 
that for a lot of them, they're still sticking to some of the forested areas, even in the south. They tend to be in these sort of forested areas. As those retreat, it's possible the bears might. I think, too, though, that they, much like dogs with thick coats, that the, black, the heavy black fur is insulating both warm and cool. So I don't think they overheat in the same way that we might if we were wearing a big black coat, say, in the heat. I have a question about the polar bears. I've been reading about the um, ice has been really melting a lot faster. Aren't they more than just vulnerable at this point? That they're really having a hard time finding enough ice to find the, uh, the food that they need, the seals that they eat? Yeah, I was actually surprised because I looked it up as I was putting this together and I expected to see endangered or even critically endangered. Uh, the last assessment was done in 2015 and they, they had still called them vulnerable, both the European sort of subpopulation and as a global population. I have to assume that that's because there are still quite a few bears out there and it may change the next time they assess it. As an aside, I also know that polar bears are starting to adapt to some of those changes. So they have been seen in recent years um, predating on seabirds more. They'll, they've seen them climbing ice shelves to get at nests and eating birds and eggs in rates that they didn't used to. So some of them are finding other ways to find protein. I mean, that's not sustainable probably, but yeah, it's a good question. And I was honestly also a little surprised. When you have a bear at the zoo that is a hibernating animal, does that change if he's in an environment where it's not necessary? That's an excellent question, and it seems to sort of change. So our bears at the zoo, we have two grizzly bears and two black bears, both of which are species that hibernate in the wild. The grizzly bears were orphans who were rescued at six months from Montana, I believe, so a, a location where they would hibernate. Um, but they never did because they were rescued when they were young and came to the zoo. They don't hibernate they do slow way down. So I study their behavior, and their behavior is vastly different in the winter. They do a lot less, they don't play, they're much less active, they come out, they eat, they sleep all day. Our black bears, on the other hand, who originally came from private ownership, so I don't know their original history, they don't technically hibernate in that every day in the winter, the keepers go in and open the door and give them some food, and you know they don't actually touch them, but give them a proverbial nudge to wake them up and they'll stand up for a minute and move around, and then they go back to sleep again. So they come as close to hibernating as they basically can and on their, of their own accord. They wouldn't need to, but they do. Where do grizzly bears fall into in your categories? Brown bears, thank you. Yeah, grizzly bears are a subspecies of brown bears. And even within grizzlies, there's a wide variation in body size and in diet. You know, our grizzlies at the zoo who originally came from Montana are about 500, 600 pounds. Because they don't come from a population where they would have been eating salmon. The salmon eating grizzly bears get much bigger. They get closer to 1,000 pounds. Are we confident that hibernation is a matter of temperature and not day length? Uh, I know that w when I visited in Alaska, um, a guy who was a high school teacher commented on uh, the fact that his students were manic in the summer and half asleep all through the winter. And I'm wondering uh, how much the light has to do with it, as well as the uh, temperature. Oh, I think it's very likely that both are signals to the bears that it's getting to that time of year. I mean, in the wild, grizzlies, as they're reaching fall and it's getting cooler and the days are getting shorter, start eating everything in sight to put on that weight. So I think it's likely that both temperature and daylight and probably all kinds of things that we don't even sense are giving them all these clues. And their other studies have shown that their physiology does change even if they're not hibernating. As they hit that time of year, their metabolism slows down, their temperature drops, even if they're not fully hibernating, a lot of those things still happen. So I'm sure that those are both salient cues for grizzly bears, yeah. Thank you for joining us. You have been watching Laura Bernstein Curtis discussing animal cognition the ability of animals to interpret the spatial and causal properties of objects in their environment. For more information on the Origin Science Scholars Program, please visit the Institute's website at origins.case.edu. In the next part of the talk, Ms. Bernstein Curtis will focus on the cognitive abilities specifically of bears. Now, back to the talk. 
All right, so now I want to talk a little bit more specifically about bear cognition and how we can learn about what bears know. So what do bears in the wild need to do? They need to find food, and they need to eat, and they need to find other bears. So to find food in a changing landscape, and I say a changing landscape both seasonally, as bears absolutely have seasonal changes in their landscape, but also in terms of our climate changing, that bears have to adapt to a changing climate as well. There are a couple of things they really need that we've been able to look at sort of experimentally. And one is object permanence. And that sounds obvious, but it's really important to know that if you see something and then you don't see it because it's hidden, that it's still there. And they also need to be able to remember where things are. Along with that, for navigating their social world, they need those same skills. They need to know that something is there. <clears throat> they need to know that just because something has say, walk, a bear has walked behind a tree, that bear is still there, and they need to be able to remember things. Further, they may need to be able to recognize other individuals. So I want to talk a little more specifically now about how we're able to look at these, these uh, abilities experimentally in a zoo setting. You can look at it cognition a couple of ways. You can study them through study through observations by watching what bears do and inferring what they must be able to do. Or you can do it the other way. You can say, I think bears can do this specific thing and test that thing and then from that be able to see if the bear can do it or not. So we're going to start with a study of sloth bears. I've got that sloth bear up there. And I want to put this in a little bit of context. This is a picture from behind the scenes of the study I'm going to tell you about. And this is behind the scenes at the Leipzig Zoo, which is an excellent zoo in Germany. And you can see the bear there. Animals participate voluntarily in these studies. So that bear is in what we refer to as the behind the scenes holding area. It's an area keepers can shift bears into while they're cleaning the exhibit. And also that they can use for, if they have medical procedures or other reasons they need the bears to be in one place. It makes for a good place to do these kinds of studies because the person is protected from the bear and the bear can choose to participate. And you see there's an experimenter there with what looks kind of like a tree trunk in front of her. So here's what they did. They took a fake tree trunk on its side with three holes in it, and they showed the, the bear some food, and then they put it inside one of those holes and covered up all the holes. And then they pushed the tree trunk up to the bear, and they waited to see which hole the bear picked. And if the bears had a sense of object permanence, they would know that that food they saw, which then was hidden, was still there. And then after this, they also tried testing the bear's short-term memory. So they did the same thing, showed them the food, put it in a hole, covered it up, and then waited. They waited 30 seconds, they waited one minute, and they waited two minutes. And in each of those cases, then they would push it forward and see if the bear could find the food. So I'm going to show you what they did. I want you to predict for yourself first what you maybe think. If you think the bears had object permanence, if you think they could remember, and then I'll tell you. Okay, so this is the graph, and this line that I'm about to show you is chance. So that's the line at which they were just guessing randomly where the food was. This circle here shows you the object permanence study. That means that's well above chance. It means it's likely that bears have an understanding of object permanence. Somewhere in the 60 to 80 percent range, those bears got it right. They could, you, they wheeled the tree trunk up, and the bear could accurately point, well, gesture with their paw, probably, at the hole in the tree trunk that had the food in it. You'll notice that the other three things are right on that chance line. Those are the short-term memory studies. That means that if the experimenters put the food in the trunk, waited 30 seconds, and then pushed it forward, the bears did not do better than chance. They did not remember where it was. Which is sort of a surprise, right? You would think that bears would remember after 30 seconds where the food went. Uh, but it may be that for sloth bears, that's just not as important to them. It's really important for a sloth bear who sees a termite walking into a hole to know that termite is still there and that that termite mound's got termites in it and we should go eat it. What the bear probably doesn't do after it sees that termite is wait 30 seconds and then say, yeah, okay, I guess I'm going to go eat those termites now. <laughs> the bear just goes and eats the termites. And likely, after they've eaten the termites, after they've torn up the termite mound some amount, 
they probably walk away. And if they're going to come back to that mound, it's not likely to be for quite a long time. Maybe next time they're in that part of their range. So it may not be that they needed to be able to remember where something was in a sort of a short term sense. Okay, next one. This one's about giant pandas. So if that was a study that showed that sloth bears have a sense of object permanence, let's, think, let's learn a little about giant pandas' memories. So this is the game of memory, and you've played this game, right? Where you have the cards flipped over, and you have to flip them over and see the matching cards and remember where the other star was, so you pick it, right? You've all played this game before. This is sort of similar to what the experimenters did with these pandas. So what you're seeing now is what the panda saw in the other side of their exhibit. You see six drawers with lights in them and a stick in the middle. And that stick is called a target stick. And the panda sat with their face right against that target stick. And then the light would go on, and it would stay on for 10 seconds, and then it would go off again. And after two seconds, the panda had to push the button, that's those silver circles in the middle of each drawer, for the light that was on to show that he remembered which light it was. I'm going to show you another picture here of the panda actually doing it. That's what it looked like. So you can see that panda there. She could voluntarily get up and leave if she wanted, but she's sitting there with her face against the target stick. And what they did is they first tested in a baseline condition. So the bear only had to wait two seconds after the light turned off, and then they could push the button. And in order to cue the bear, the keepers used a, or the experimenters used a vibrating timer. So it would be vibrating, vibrating, it stops vibrating. Now the bear knows I can go ahead and push the button. So they did it for two seconds, and then they added up. They added in increments of two, four, six, eight, ten, all the way up to 20 seconds to test the bear's memory. So again, I want you to predict how you think the pandas did, knowing what you already know about sloth bears. All right. So this was how the two pandas did on um, this memory task. So again, I'm going to show you chance, just to emphasize that black line there is if they were guessing randomly. And as you can see, the blue and the pink lines, which are the two bears, are well above chance. So they weren't guessing randomly. They remembered which lights went off, particularly in the early time periods. So at, at uh, two seconds, they got 60% of those right. And if you think about it, you might think they should do better, but how good are you at the game of memory, right? It's hard to remember what went on where. So maybe 60 seconds isn't bad. And they did pretty well, four seconds, six seconds, 10 seconds. They could still remember which box was lit up, right until we got to 15 or 20 seconds when the task got hard, and they weren't able to remember anymore. So how would they have done on that 30-second sloth bear task we had before? Maybe not great. Yeah, maybe they couldn't have done that either. Alternatively, how would the sloth bears do on this? We don't know. Maybe the sloth bears could do 10 seconds, and 30 seconds was just a little too long. These are great questions that I don't know the answer to, because no one has done these studies in these opposite species yet. Um, the other thing I'd like to point out about this study is that when the bears started forgetting which light was lit up, they still remembered which side it was on. So when they made mistakes, they weren't guessing randomly. They could still kind of remember, oh, that was on the left, or that was on the right. So their memory wasn't only restricted to it, they still kind of had a general sense of where something was, which might be enough for pandas, who basically eat bamboo. They're not chasing down prey in the tundra. <laughs> Maybe remembering the general area where something is, is good enough. OK, now, one more panda study. And I don't mean to seem like I'm only choosing pandas and sloth bears. It's just that cognitive studies have really only been done on pandas, sloth bears, and black bears. And this panda study that's next is really cool. So I really wanted to show you this one. So if you look at a panda's face, they have a very distinctive pattern. right? They have those black marks over their eyes and very white otherwise. So you might imagine that that is important to pandas, being able to see something that distinctive, that they might recognize each other using those facial features. So this next study looked at facial recognition in pandas and the ability to discriminate shapes. So this is a picture, again, from behind the scenes where the study was done. You can see in A, there's the panda um, looking at some pictures, which I'm going to show you in a better um, image later, um, doing this voluntarily. As you can see, they even made a little seat for her to sit on so she'd be comfortable, because it's not a very um, natural position for a bear to sit in. And on the right is the apparatus that the, um, uh, the 
experimenters saw, where they were able to put in the pictures that they were asking the bear to discriminate. So I'll show you what those look like. That top row was the very first test. So the bears had to learn to discriminate a circle from a square and a triangle, which look pretty different from each other. And they did this by putting the cards, the square, the circle, the triangle, in front of the bear and rewarding the bear for touching the circle. And then they'd mix them up. And now they're in a different order. And now it's triangle, circle, square. And the bear would touch the circle. And they did this until the bear was able to distinguish the circle in any combination of those cards. So OK, bears can tell circles, fine. Then they made it a little harder. Now they took what kind of looks like a panda face, oh, two, bra two uh, black ovals facing in and parallel and facing out. Bears could do that. OK, so now we went to only ovals that look like panda's eyes, but at a very three very different angles. Bears could do that too. So then they made it harder. Then they took these three angles of ovals. And I don't know about you, I th find these a little hard to tell the difference between already. So 80 degrees, 64 degrees, and 48 degrees. So not that different. And they had the bears distinguish these, these uh, shapes. They could do it. Fine, then they made it harder. Now they look a little more like panda bear markings. Still somewhat different from each other. I think that most of us could tell the difference between these three shapes. And the bears could do it. You ready for the next one? They said, fine, <laughs> bears, <laughs> let's see what you can do. So now they made it really tricky. So now the bear had to tell that shape when it was mixed up with variations of all those other shapes. And they could do it for that row, and for this row, and for this final row. And when I look at those, some of them seem easy to tell the difference between, and some do not, that I think I'd be able to tell fairly easily, and some would take some practice. Now you might be saying, well, this was only a study with two bears. It was. Can you generalize this to the whole species? Maybe not. On the other hand, the fact that panda bears were able to tell distinctions of facial markings to this difference, these subtle differences, would suggest that there's a reason they can do that. That these must be important and salient cues for panda bears in the wild, that they can recognize each other by these slight differences in shape on their faces. And in fact, not only can they recognize this, but these two bears, one was tested six months later and one tested a year later, they could still remember these shapes. So they were able to do it later. So that in, it even further suggests that remembering different shapes of facial markings must be important for pandas. I don't know if they tried the short-term memory test on this. This was it right in front of them the whole time. I don't know how they do on that. And I also want to make it clear, it's not just that they got this right one out of every 10 times. They were able to distinguish these shapes 80% or more of the time in three consecutive sessions. So it wasn't just by chance and it wasn't just that one bear got lucky. They were able to recognize these shapes repeatedly. This is a little unfair, but you know we use vision a lot, so that's logical that you would look at those sorts of discriminations. But as we know, bears have extremely good smell. They have similar tasks. I don't know how you would define different smells, but is there similar work done with odor? People have tested, I think, just to figure out what bears can smell and what they haven't. Um, they've done it in other species, like an elephant's smell works better. They don't have very good vision, and so they found that scents work much better. Um, pandas in particular, vision seemed worth testing, in part because they seem to be, they have other cues suggest that they are very visual bears. So for example, um, they scent mark in the wild to mark where they've been and other bears can find them. Pandas almost always scent mark and scratch the tree. So the tree is marked and it's scent marked and, it, and they've done experiments sort of where they've seen that if they mark something with scent and they don't scratch the tree, like if the experimenter doesn't mark the tree, the bear is less likely to notice the scent mark. So pandas in particular seem to be visually attuned which I think is one reason they thought this was worth looking at, that it may be related to these other visual skills, that if it's so important for them to recognize social individuals, it may be more important to them than possibly other species. First of all, what was the purpose of the target stick? And second of all, um, how were the bears rewarded? The purpose of the target stick was so that the bear wouldn't shift and sit in front of the light that had gone on and thus help themselves remember. Basically, it was a neutral spot where they had to stay so that all they could do was look at the light 
and remember where it was. Um, and they were rewarded with small food rewards. So often that's some kind of fruit, grape, apple, something like that. My question is related to the first question. Uh, uh, I was wondering whether in that uh, uh, that experiment where the uh, the log was uh, lying down and there were the holes in it, whether the, it was the smell that the, bear, the bears were using rather than uh, visual memory. Excellent question. Um, so they, the experimenters did a control to make sure that the bears weren't just following the scent and not remembering where the food was. And to do that, they would bait the log where the bears couldn't see it. So they'd put food in it out of sight of the bear, push it up in front, and see if the bears could find it. And they couldn't. They couldn't do any better than chance. Which means that the experimenters used food that didn't probably have a very strong scent to it and was far, or far enough back that the bears couldn't find it, which is how they controlled for that. Yes, thank you. Excellent question. Given that you've done this experiment on a couple of bears you know, in most instances, can you generalize those results into the basic population? I think it's tough to generalize beyond, do you mean within the individual species or to bears as a whole? It's an interesting question how much you can generalize from these studies to the whole species. Um, and I've had this discussion with other people before about depending on how bear animals are reared, if they're able to do more things than their wild counterparts could do. It seems unlikely that they'd be able to do something that was totally outside the capabilities of other bears. Now I'll grant if only two bears are able to do something, it's tough to generalize to everyone, but I think it suggests that that is a reasonable question to ask and it would be worth doing in a bigger sample because it's likely that if these two bears who just happen to be the bears there can do it, there's a good chance that others are able to do it too, even if not every single bear could. Besides the uh, intrinsic curiosity you and others have about the capabilities of bears and other species, how, how does it help you in terms of assisting their survival or staying with us here on the planet? <laughs> I Whatever. think understanding what bears can do and how they use the resources that they have or how they are able to navigate their habitat is helpful to people who are working to conserve bears to understand, for instance, what needs to be conserved. Or to understand that if you cut a habitat down too small, maybe they won't be able to find um, the food they're looking for. Um, I love that you asked that question because it's actually a great segue into my final section as to how we're able to use their cognition uh, to improve the way we take care of them uh, in zoos as well. We hope you've been enjoying the Origin Science Scholars Program with Laura Bernstein Curtis. Ms. Bernstein Curtis is a graduate research associate at the Cleveland Metro Park Zoo and currently completing her PhD in biology as part of a joint program through the Zoo and Case Western Reserve University's Department of Biology. In the second part of our talk, we learned how bears' cognitive abilities relate to their lives, especially their search for food. In our final segment, Ms. Bernstein Curtis will talk about how our understanding of bear cognition affects our ability to assess their welfare in captivity. Now, back to our talk. So now, bear with me. Yeah, yeah, I worked on that. We're gonna take a leap into a slightly different direction for a minute before we come right back to bears. So as I mentioned, I also work at Cleveland Metro Park Zoo. And I wanted to talk just a little bit about zoos, and especially the Association of Zoos and Aquariums, or the AZA. AZA is the accreditation body for zoos in North America. And in order to be accredited by AZA, a zoo has to reach a number of standards um, in animal care, in animal welfare, in safety, in conservation, in education. And it's something that takes a lot of work on the part of the zoo to do. In America, there are about 26,000 or so licensed exhibitors of animals. And the word zoo is not copywritten anywhere. Anyone can use the word zoo. Of those 26,000 licensed exhibitors, about 235 have AZA accreditation. So it's not something that's easy to do, and it really represents what we think of as the gold standard in what zoos are able to do. So when I talk about zoos, those are the kinds of zoos I'm talking about. 
and the kinds of research um, opportunities we want to be increasing. And as a part of AZA, and as a zoo that's a part of AZA, one really big focus is animal welfare. And in zoos, we have gotten over the years really good at identifying what we call these indicators of maybe negative welfare. So things like injury, disease, low weight, lack of reproduction, those sorts of things, we've gotten really good at assessing and understanding and learning to prevent and mitigate. That picture there is of uh, zoo vets at uh, Smithsonian's National Zoo working on a baby panda cub because there's nothing cuter than a baby panda cub, except maybe a sloth bear cub. I don't know if I've mentioned that yet. I'm kidding, I know. Um, we've gotten really good at that. We can do that really well, and we're really good at helping to solve some of those things. We know how to prevent disease. We take good care of our animals. They have a healthy diet. They're a good weight. We have them in, as much as we can in proper social groups. We put them in exhibits that are nice. We've got enrichment to help um, take good care of them. And we often are able to look at them, and we see what we can think of as sort of neutral welfare. They don't have any of those other problems I mentioned. They're not sick. They have good body weight. They're eating. What's harder to do after we can see that they're in sort of a neutral welfare state is to assess what we call positive welfare. So great, there's nothing that we can see that's wrong, but how do we know what else is going on if something really good is going on under the surface? Now, we do have a couple of ways to do this. Behavior is one way we do it. We assess behavior. This is something I spend a lot of time doing. And we look at animals and how they're behaving in the zoo setting and compare it to how wild animals generally behave? Do they have approximately the same activity budget? Do they send, spend the same amount of time moving and eating? Do they interact with their social partners the same way that they would in the wild? And of course, another excellent indicator of good welfare is play in animals who do it. So if you have baby bears, you better expect they're going to be playing together. Um, in fact, our grizzly bears at the zoo, who I know I mentioned were rescued as orphans, they're not babies anymore. They're seven years old, and they're fully grown grizzly bears, and they play a lot. But play is only helpful in animals who are doing it. If you see an adult female bear, she may not have reason to play. And that doesn't mean that she's not experiencing positive welfare, that something is good. Lack of play doesn't mean that things are bad. It just means that we can't use that now as a, as a test in an animal that we're not going to see playing. And people often ask when we talk about animal welfare, they'll say, yeah, but how do you know the animals are happy? Right? Which is a tough question. If I asked you, how do you know you're happy? That's not always an easy question to answer, right? let alone trying to do it for animals. But that doesn't mean that how they're feeling isn't something that we might be able to look at and use as a way to assess their welfare. So I want to talk now about a new way of, a new method of assessing uh, animal welfare. And that's using something called cognitive bias. And this comes from the human literature. And it's the idea that how you're feeling affects how you behave. And it might affect how you respond to some sort of test. Specifically, your expectation of outcomes. So we know that humans who are anxious or depressed are less likely to predict positive outcomes. Right? They're not as likely to expect good things to happen. They're more likely to expect bad things to happen. And this is actually a question we can ask in animals. And I'm going to explain in more detail in a moment. When I say this is a new method, it's actually been done for the last 15 years or so in a whole variety of species. So every species up here, plus probably a good 20 more or so, people have done these sorts of tests in. It started out in laboratories, people looking at lab rats, and has been done quite a bit in farm animals, domesticated animals, and is starting to work its way into zoos as a way to look at welfare. OK, so how do we ask animals how they feel? I'm going to ask you to play along with me for a minute. Indulge me, please. When you see the black box on the next screen, I want you to raise your right hand. And when you see the white box, you're going to raise your left hand. OK, so let's practice. Black box, right hand. Good. White box, left hand. Good. Got it? OK, let's practice. OK, right. Good. Left. Good. And one more time. Right. Good. Left. Good. All right. <laughs> I saw a bunch of double hands. I like that. 
All right, so I know you're thinking, hey, what was that gray box? That was a trick. You said it was gonna be black and white, and now you're showing me gray. Well, of course, the gray box is actually the test. That's what we call the ambiguous stimulus. I taught you two ends of a spectrum, black and white, and then I wanted to see what you did when I showed you something in the middle. Okay, so now we're gonna up the stakes a little. Well, not really, I'll need you to pretend with me. <laughs> you do still get dinner. <laughs> I want you to imagine that you're going to get as a reward a high value food item. Now, I didn't bring any for you, I'm sorry. Um, plus, we probably all have different high value reward items. But whatever would be your favorite, maybe chocolate, maybe french fries. For me, it would definitely be a Reese's peanut butter cup. But you can imagine your own, what would be a really high value food reward. And we're gonna use food because bears do things for food, we do things for food, I think it's appropriate. That's your high value. Your low value reward, though, is gonna be something a little different. It's still gonna be something good, but it's not a Reese's peanut butter cup. It's probably not even like a sandwich or something. I think for your low value reward, I want you to imagine I'm gonna give you a high five, right? And that's, I mean, that's fine. I must seem like a cool lady, right? That would be neat, but that's no French fries. That's no bowl of ice cream, all right? Okay, so we're gonna connect that now to the task. So when you see the black box, I want you to imagine you're getting your high value reward. And you raise your, which hand? Right hand. right hand, thank you. And when you see the white box, you're gonna get your low value reward, which is a high five, and you're gonna raise your left hand. Okay, are you ready? Right? Good, oh, you guys are great. <laughs> left, good. All right, what do you think? Right or left? You gotta make a choice. <laughs> you only get to pick one. All right, so I see some people picking right and some people picking left, great. So this is basically what we can do to ask animals how they feel too. It's what do you expect to happen, which behavior do you think, which reward are you gonna get for that thing that's in the middle that's not the two things you learned. Basically, there's an optimistic response and a pessimistic response, right? So if you're feeling optimistic, you're excited about this talk, you really like bears and you haven't heard much about bears before, maybe you know dinner's coming and you're excited about it, you saw gray and you thought, yeah, gray is worth a peanut butter cup. Gray is worth my french fries, definitely I'm gonna get that. Or maybe you're a little tired tonight, it was snowing yesterday and now it isn't and you don't know what's going on with this Cleveland weather. You were tired, you don't wanna go out on a Tuesday. You saw Gray and you thought, Gray's not gonna get me anything good. I can't believe dinner is still another eight minutes away. There's no way. <laughs> I'm definitely just getting a high five for this Gray box. Now, this is obviously an oversimplification, but not really by much. This is basically how we can ask animals the same thing. Now, I'm not giving bears Reese's peanut butter cups, <laughs> don't worry, um, but their high value reward still might be a grape or a piece of apple, you know, some kind of nice fruit that they don't get a lot of. And the low value reward is gonna be some food that they'll eat, but it's not their favorite. Maybe some lettuce, maybe a little piece of chow. Something fine, something they'll still eat, so they still want to work for it, but not as exciting as that grape or the french fries. All right, so the future then is that I am actually just starting this very type of study at Cleveland Metro Park Zoo. So we actually have four species of bears. I told you about our black bears and our grizzly bears. We also have Andean bears and sloth bears. And my hope is to do this with all four of these species. And what we're going to do is compare responses between different conditions. So they recently had an automatic feeder um, installed in two of the bear exhibits. And that's a machine that goes up high. And when the bear is in the exhibit, it turns on unbeknownst to them and shoots food down at random times, right? So that's exciting. Food raining from the sky when you don't expect it. That's pretty good. Um, and we're going to compare responses on this type of task, responses to that gray box, after they've been in the exhibit with the magic food raining down from the sky for a while, and when they've been in the same exhibit with the, with the food feeder off. So no magic food raining from the sky. And I predict that we will see more optimistic responses after the hour or so spent with surprise food showing up compared to the regular hour where nothing is showing up. Um, I haven't gotten quite started yet, so watch this space. I hope to be able to come back and tell you all about it at some point. Um, but for now, that's where I am. Okay, so in summary, 
Bears have complicated ecological and social problems to solve. And they may, different species may have different challenges. I only told you about studies done in sloth bears and pandas, both of whom eat food that is fairly stationary. Right, that bamboo is not going anywhere. And termites move, but the mounds don't get up and leave. I wonder how polar bears would do on some of those things. Polar bears who have to hunt down their food. Or grizzly bears who do sometimes hunt down food, but don't always and don't always have to. There's so much we don't know yet about how these different species respond to these challenges in their environment. And it's worth asking, because a polar bear in the Arctic hunting seals is very different than a panda bear sitting down eating bamboo for 20 hours a day. Really, we know very little about what bears are capable of. In fact, you might even say that we've barely scratched the surface of what bears are capable of. On the experiment with the sloth bear, were the other two holes also curtained off? Uh, or was the bear just finding the hole with the, with the cover on it? Great question. So about the sloth bear object permanent study, yes, the other holes were covered too. So the experimenter took the food, put it in one hole, and then curtained off all three. And I think they always did it the same way. They always went left to right before they moved it or held it. So yes, thank you. I would have been interested in finding whether they understand verbal cues. Oh, whether the bears understand verbal cues? I mean, all of our bears at Cleveland Metro Park Zoo and bears in a lot of AZA zoos have a, are trained to do a variety of things. So all of our bears certainly know their names and respond when called by the keepers, not just by anybody. If you tell zoo guests a bear's name, sometimes they yell it at them. They don't listen to that. Uh, but they know their keepers, and they respond to the keepers' voices. And the keepers do a variety of things. They'll get them to come in front of the mesh, put their paws up. Um, some are actually a number of our bears are trained for blood draws. So I didn't talk about that today, but one of the great things you can do with training, especially for animals as smart as bears, is train them to participate in their own care. So our facility is built essentially a sleeve, a mesh sleeve that's attached to the door um, in the holding area. And the bears have learned to put their hand in, hold on, and then wait while a veterinarian shaves and inserts a needle and draws blood. Incredible, right? I mean, it's hard to get people to do that. <laughs> Yeah, and we've done it with a, quite a few of our species. Our, our keepers also do it with a lot of our cat species. They do it from their tail. They have a little door and pull the tip of the tail out, and they take blood from their tail. So it's actually really incredible what you can do, and pretty clear that they do understand quite a few verbal cues. Yeah, thank you. The Origin Science Scholars Lectures are presented by Case Western Reserve University's Institute for the Science of Origins, with the assistance of the Siegel Lifelong Learning Program, the College of Arts and Sciences, and Media Vision. For more information on the Origin Science Scholars Program, including a full video archive, please visit the Institute's website at origins.case.edu.